We've been told since we were toddlers that the sun is a great ball of gas with nuclear reactions in its centre. We are told it's been producing heat and light for thousands of millions of years. Well, where did that story come from? There have been several theories. The first two scientists who put forward a reasoned explanation were Hermann von Helmholtz in Germany and William Thomson, better known as Lord Kelvin in England. Both were excellent mathematicians who studied a wide range of problems in several branches of science. Their work led Kelvin to formulate the first and second laws of thermodynamics, and it led to both of them independently deducing how it would be possible for the sun to produce its heat and light. They found that gravitational contraction would account for all the energy coming from the sun. Their theory would allow the sun to keep shining for just under 9 million years. Of course, this gives no indication of how long ago it started shining, but it was soon realised that this destroys Charles Lyell's hundreds of millions of years and Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. If the sun's energy comes from gravitational contraction, then even a tiny change in diameter, a few metres each year, if pushed back to anywhere near Lyle 600 million years, would lead to the sun being so big that the earth would have been far too hot for life to survive. So Darwin's theory was untenable. Kelvin also applied his newly developed laws of thermodynamics to calculate a possible maximum age for the earth. He eventually satisfied himself that observations combined with his calculations indicated the possible age of the Earth to be in the range 20 to 40 million years. He declared Darwin's evolution to be a fiction, and he made the statement, When you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre, and unsatisfactory kind. Nobody has ever taken measurements on one kind of creature changing into another kind. Kelvin was also probably the first to dismiss evolution on the grounds of the second law of thermodynamics. As we saw in episodes 9 and 10, despite a century of trying, evolutionists still have no plausible answer to the second law and its disproof of evolution gets more crushing with each new discovery of the complexity of life. But, as in Calvin's day, evolution is absolutely essential to the atheist worldview, so it's protected by being the best in the field theory and is therefore untouchable, no matter how soundly discredited. The secular humanists kept on looking for a way to make the sun have a longer lifespan. Until Arthur Eddington had a brainwave, nuclear reactions in the sun might give a much longer lifespan. So everybody said, yes, that's it. Well, of course, that still doesn't tell us how long it has actually been shining, but at least it registered the possibility that it might have been shining much as it is now for a long time so it does not wipe out evolution, and it was accepted with joy. Nobody was able to go to the sun and find out what actually happens there, but one day a German scientist called Hans Bieter was on a train journey in Germany. He got out pencil and paper and started theorising about what reactions might be happening in the sun. He proposed the proton-proton reaction, and everybody said, yes! That must be it. Then Fred Hoyle got to work theorising about all the other things that must be happening in the sun. He set up a world-famous astronomical research lab at Cambridge University and wrote vastly complex computer programmes which he called All Hell Let Loose programmes, showing what must be happening in the sun. Then it was found out the sun is pulsating. 
analysis of those pulsations showed that the temperature inside the sun cannot be high enough even for nuclear reactions to start. So they set out to prove that there are nuclear reactions anyway. The theory demands that some particles called electron neutrinos must be produced in the reactions. So they built an electron neutrino detector at the Homestakes gold mine in America and started counting. They found a third of the number that should be coming from the sun and since some neutrinos from other sources were expected, they couldn't be sure that any of them came from the sun. Then they built a much bigger neutrino detector called Kamio Kanda in Japan. Still too few electron neutrinos. So there seemed to be a compromise possible. Some of the sun's energy comes from nuclear reactions and the rest comes from gravitational contraction. But that was no good. It still means that the sun would have to be too big too recently to allow any hope at all for evolution. Then they built a detector at Sudbury in Canada for all types of neutrinos. There are two other types called muon and tau. They have much lower energies and are not part of the sun's theoretical nuclear reactions. They found enough neutrinos, counting all types, but the reactions in the sun was supposed to produce that number of electron neutrinos. With a wave of a theoretical magic wand, abracadabra, the electron neutrinos changed into other kinds of neutrinos while they were travelling from the sun. The theory did not allow that to happen. But one can always fiddle with, or shall we say, adjust a theory to make it say what you want it to say. So, hey presto, Takaiki Kajita of Kamiakanda and Arthur MacDonald of Sudbury were awarded a Nobel Prize and electron neutrinos can now change from one kind to another just as certainly as they could not do so when the proton-proton theory was invented. It shows how much confidence the astronomers have in their own theories. They can be changed to fit in with what they want any time they like. And now the sun definitely generates all its power by nuclear reactions. Still, however long the sun can go on shining, that does not tell us how long the sun has been shining. But can't we come up with a theory that tells us? Let's look at that next time. But first, let's look at what a world expert on the sun John A. Eddy, said at a conference we looked at in episode 25. I suspect that the sun is 4.5 billion years old. However, given some new and unexpected results to the contrary, and some time for frantic readjustment, I suspect that we could live with Bishop Usher's value for the age of the earth and sun I don't think we have much in the way of observational evidence in astronomy to conflict with that. Bishop Usher got his age from the Bible. Is there any good reason why we should trust the suspicions and the rapidly changing theories of the secular humanists rather than the unchanging word of God? Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.